Okay, and then, then I can now go to the last presentation for this session, which is from Prof. Ambati. Uh, Sasha Gri, are you here? Um, on supervisory control configurations for improved operability of biological wastewater treatment plants. Over, you, over to you, Sasha Gri. Yeah, yeah, I'm available and yes, yeah, I'm ready to take my session. Perfect. So it's over to you then. Yeah, thank you. So I'll share my screen. Yeah, um, is my screen visible? It's very visible. As I said, it's visible. Perfect. Yeah, it's now in full screen as well. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, good afternoon to all. And uh, I am going to talk about uh, on the topic supervisory control configurations for improved operability of uh, wastewater treatment plants. And I am from uh, Department of Chemical Engineering from Indian Institute of Petroleum and Energy, Vishakhapatnam in India. This is uh, going to be the outline of my talk. I'll introduce you about the process which we have considered for design of control systems and then the modeling framework in order to deploy the control strategies and some of the control strategies what we have developed in order to uh, achieve better effluent quality and also minimize the operational cost. And also, I'll also uh, briefly outline about our ongoing research uh, followed by conclusions. Yeah, so any typical uh, wastewater treatment plant involves uh, primary treatment, uh, secondary treatment, and tertiary treatment. And uh, in this, what uh, we have considered in our uh, research work is basically the secondary treatment of uh, wastewater, which is a biological process. And all of us know that uh, activated sludge process is the most widely used uh, biological uh, treatment for liquid waste, essentially uh, because uh, it is available at a cheaper cost and also it is uh, 100 years old uh, technology and it can be adopted to treat any kind of uh, wastewater generated, be it uh, municipal wastewater or industrial wastewater. And the typical idea in activated sludge process is the influent is uh, sent into an aeration tank. And after uh, giving enough amount of time for the biological activity happening in the aeration tank in the presence of air, then it is sent to the clarifier and some portion of the uh, waste activated sludge is returned, which is called as the return activated sludge to maintain enough biomass in the aeration section. Yeah, so from a mathematical modeling point of view, the aeration or the reactor zone uh, can be divided into five CSTRs in series, and they can be understood as uh, anoxic reactors uh, followed by aerobic reactors. So the reactions happening in the anoxic reactors is basically denitrification where nitrate is converted into nitrogen gas. And this nitrate basically comes from the aerobic section in which ammonium is converted into nitrite uh, because of the bacteria nitrosmonas. And these are the corresponding reactions. And this nitrate in turn is oxidized in order to produce nitrate. And the internal recycle is uh, supplying the enough amount of uh, nitrate in the anoxic zone for the denitrification to happen. With that, the nitrogen gas is evolved from the anoxic zone. And there is external recycle from the secondary clarifier to maintain enough biomass. So then we have the secondary clarifier in which usually it is assumed that there is no biological activity, but uh, some of the recent uh, research works uh, stated that there are uh, reactive settlers in which there are some reactions uh, happening. And the internal recycle uh, will help to improve the nitrogen removal in the anoxic tanks. And then the sludge recycle is to maintain enough uh, microbial biomass in the reactors for the biological reactions to happen. So when we say the uh, biological treatment in the secondary stage, well, the fundamental uh, requirement is to meet the stringent environmental legislations as uh, stipulated by the uh, national uh, regulatory authorities 
and at the same time maximize the profitability through reduced operating cost this is one of the important factors because uh, many wastewater treatment plants uh, suffers with uh, huge operating costs so if at all there are mechanisms to reduce the operating costs they are uh, well taken in all the existing uh, treatment plants so that there are uh, incentives for the operators and also uh, operators should understand what is actually happening in their processes and what are the ways what are the possible ways to minimize the operational expenditures and moreover uh, because of the huge cost involved in maintaining the aeration process there is uh, you know in fact uh, half of the plant energy costs are going into aeration and hence a tight control of uh, dissolved oxygen levels in the aerated sections will definitely help the operators to reduce the costs so with this uh, in mind uh, we have understood about the role of control strategies and how different types of control strategies will help to at least the cost uh, to save some of these costs without compromising on the effluent quality and we started looking at uh, for the secondary treatment when the interest is only nitrogen removal from the treatment plant by considering uh, a five reactors in series uh, for the biological reactions to happen followed by a secondary clarifier in which there is anoxic zone and then aerobic zone and from a control perspective uh, if the dissolved oxygen levels in the aerobic reactors are maintained at appropriate values and also the nitrate concentration in the anoxic section at appropriate value by manipulating the air supply to the aeration zone and the internal recycle available in the to the anoxic section it is expected that we will get good amount of effluent without having many violations as per the control board norms and at the same time spending less amount of energy so this is one architecture when the interest is only nitrogen removal and when we are interested in both uh, nutrients like uh, both nitrogen and phosphorus then definitely the architecture is changed by introducing anaerobic reactors ahead of anoxic reactors and it is something like you know a seven reactor combination followed by a secondary clarifier so to uh, apply control strategies uh, suitable mathematical models need to be developed and we started with the understanding of uh, activated sludge model in which there are eight basic processes uh, considered which are represented with the 13 state variables yeah so the uh, physical attributes for all the reactors and the settler are considered uh, something like this which is a replica of a typical uh, a sewage treatment plant in order to design the control strategies and the temperature is considered Uh, constant at the 15 degrees but uh, it need not be maintained at 15 so based on the regions it may change and uh, we have looked at that aspect also in our research and uh, the mathematical model according to you know international water association uh, 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 task group uh, asm1 activated sludge model 1 for all the reactors uh, they are considered as uh, cstrs continuous state tank reactors and for all the reactors the model is developed based on first principles and for writing the model for oxygen we have to take into account the corresponding external supply of air uh, which is represented with the corresponding mass transfer coefficient kla and, and at the same time what is the saturation value of the dissolved oxygen concentration and usually it is uh, recommended that 8 mg per liter is the saturated value for any uh, do values in wastewater environment yeah so these are all the you know the corresponding uh, kinetic mechanisms according to asm1 model for all the eight uh, basic processes uh, given in this uh, gujar matrix so the complete mathematical model will be based on all these kinetic mechanisms after substitution in this corresponding uh, reaction rates
So uh, this is a complex model consisting of 13 state variables, meaning 13 ordinary differential equations for one reactor. And when there are five reactors, we will have a 65 uh, equations. And for the secondary clarifier, again, to represent or to develop a mathematical model, we have to know how the settling happens. So if this is the secondary clarifier, there is clarification zone on the top and the thickening zone at the bottom. This is waste activated sludge and this is the written activated sludge. So when entering into the settler, all the particulate components are lumped together into a single variable called as the X. And it is assumed that no biological reactions occur. And uh, of course, uh, it is just an assumption, but there are studies that uh, it can be reactive settler. And to develop the mathematical model, uh, Takas has considered it you know, a stack of layers and the concentration within each layer is assumed to be a constant and it is named after him as the Takas model and it is a well uh, taken model for uh, representing secondary clarifier in a typical activated sludge process. So uh, once we represent the activated sludge process, we should know how the state variables are related to the effluent quality, uh, COD, BOD, suspended solids, nitrogen, and of course, when we take phosphorus, it should also be taken into account. So they are all related to the state variables. So once we understand about the effluent quality, we can retrieve the state variables or vice versa. And to uh, develop the control strategies, we have considered the average influent composition as recommended by the benchmark for the composite variables and also for the uh, state variables. This is the data for all those uh, variables. And to analyze the uh, strategies, whatever we develop, we have taken a dynamic influent data for different uh, weather conditions because in a year there are different seasons and we have to address the quality of the effluent for all those seasons, irrespective of you know the times and uh, weeks or months and whatever it may be. So this is you know typical uh, flow behavior, and it it, it it follows a diurnal pattern because uh, if you look at the x-axis, it is 14 days data, and uh, in on weekdays it, the trend is similar, but on weekends the trend is different. Similarly, the next week it is similar, and on weekends it is different. So that's why it is a diurnal pattern. And similarly, for the corresponding state variables, that is dynamic data taken in order to uh, understand how the control strategies work. And this is for uh, these uh, state variables. Yeah, so the performance assessment is carried out by strictly you know, following the environmental legislations for uh, COD, BOD, nitrogen, ammonia, and total suspended solids. And at the same time, the important point is analyzing the effluent quality index and also the cost associated with the operation of the treatment plant, that is overall cost index, which is a combination of the aeration energy, pumping energy, sludge production cost, external carbon addition, if at all uh, is there, and uh, mixing energy. So we have to determine all these energies and then one can arrive at the overall cost index for the treatment plan. Yeah, so having uh, those things, now we can uh, design the controllers, but the objective here is to minimize the operational cost associated with the treatment plant and also the effluent quality because we need to follow these uh, regulatory norms. So it should be, these values should be in terms of effluent quality index and it should be as small as possible, okay? And that means we need to develop control strategies for nitrification and denitrification processes by properly maintaining dissolved oxygen levels as well as the nitrate concentrations in the anoxic reactors. Yeah, so that means from a control perspective for the given uh, treatment plant, this treatment plant, the controlled variables are the output variables are the nitrate concentration in the anoxic zone and the dissolved oxygen concentration in the aerobic zones here. For that, the manipulated variables available are internal recycle flow rate and oxygen transfer coefficient. So internal recycle flow rate is used to maintain nitrate concentrations 
and oxygen transfer coefficient is used to maintain the dissolved oxygen concentrations. Of course, uh, we cannot uh, get away without having disturbances. So there are disturbances entering into the plant and these disturbances are primarily coming along with the influent because of the seasonal variations, temperature variations, and of course, based on the influent load conditions itself, the flow rate itself. So handling the disturbances is very, very important while maintaining these concentrations in a typical wastewater treatment plant. So that is at the local activated sludge process level. And when we consider at the plant level, we have to account all the primary clarifier, thickener, centrobic digester, dewatering unit, storage tank, and so on. So this is the uh, full scale uh, plant for uh, nitrogen removal. And when we are interested in both nitrogen and phosphorus removal, the architecture here will change and the remaining things uh, will be same. So when we say we would like to deploy the control strategies, we are primarily looking at uh, this portion. And it is understood that by deploying control strategies for this zone, we will automatically see that the effluent quality is within the limits and the energy uses for operating this plant this portion of the plant is minimized. Yeah. So uh, to proceed further for the design of controllers, uh, it is always recommended to determine the set points automatically and track those set points by using a local or lower level control scheme. So this is what you know the main contribution here. So we have taken up this idea and design a two level uh, control architectures in which the top layer determines the set points based on the available information and then pass those set points to the next level. And the controllers available in the lower level make, I mean, track those set points given by the upper layer. So that means when we consider for a nitrogen removal plant, so we have lower level control strategies to maintain DO and the nitrogen here. But at the same time, now we should determine the set points for them. So that determination of set points is done based on the ammonia levels in the last aeration zone. And this ammonia is taken as the feedback signal. And we know the maximum limit for effluent ammonia that is a value lesser than the maximum limit four is given as the set point here. And based on that, this controller determines the dissolved oxygen requirement. So that is taken as a set point and it is passed to the lower level control loop. At the same time, as I have mentioned, the disturbances which are associated with the influent are also handled by this uh, local level controller, lower level controller. So this is the main idea in design of supervisory control strategies. And we have designed different types of controllers at both lower level as well as the higher level, at PI and model predictive controls, and both local and higher level model predictive control strategies, and then a higher level a fuzzy control strategy, and then fuzzy and MPC control strategy. And uh, to do or uh, to design those control strategies, identification of a model at the local operating conditions is required. And to develop a control relevant model, a prediction error minimization method is uh, used here. And the idea in this is we have to minimize the difference between the measurement and the predicted one step ahead, the predicted quantity of the output. Okay, in by using the prediction error minimization approach and based on that one can arrive at a suitable control relevant model as something like state space model or any other forms, ARX model and other forms. And to do that, uh, here we have a two control loops as I have mentioned, and uh, we have to excite the inputs to collect the data of the outputs for that a plus or minus 10% multiple steps are given as the excitation signals in the manipulated variables in the sense that in the air supply mass transfer coefficient KLA and then the internal recycle rate. Okay, so and after giving that 
yeah this is the internal recycle rate and this is the oxygen transfer coefficient a random input source is given and accordingly the output is uh, the, the output is measured and based on the input output the data suitable models are developed and once those models are developed the control strategies are designed and deployed on the treatment plant so the do set points whatever are computed based on you know the ammonia levels available in the last aerobic reactor are given here so the red one is the do set point computed by the supervisory controller and the green one is the corresponding tracking by the lower level controller and if you can see different types of uh, controllers three different controllers are shown here so different types of controllers provide different kinds of uh, set points but all of them if you look at they are around 2 because usually the recommended value for the dissolved oxygen in wastewater environment is 2 but it need not be always 2 so that is what uh, the recommendation uh, that means, for example if you look at here based on the influent and the availability of ammonia many times it is not 2 it is lesser than 2 that means we need not supply more amount of air and waste our energy requirement so this is where you know this will contribute to save the energy by maintaining whatever is required for do similarly here many times it is lesser than 2 and here also many times it is lesser than 2 so by having these set points for do based on the data available we are uh, contributing to saving the energy in the treatment plant so this is uh, the uh, after implementing the control strategies uh, this is the result for mpc mpc controller for the effluent quality these are the uh, data considered for simulation studies if you look at here uh, cod uh, suspended solids and bod are very well within the legal limits whereas uh, nitrogen and ammonia violated the limits at some particular instance of time but of course it is not desirable but at the same time Uh, if as a cumulative you know concentration it can be bring uh, it can be brought to the legal limit of 18 here and uh, 4 here but of course uh, we can still look at how one can reduce these uh, violations and when you calculate the operational cost index for different types of uh, control strategies so the objective here is to have both oci and eqi as small as possible but uh, you know uh, it 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 always you know doesn't uh, happen both oci and eqi because they are all you know a trade off uh, variables so when we look at minimizing oci uh, obviously eqi will increase on the other hand when we would like to decrease eqi oci may increase so we have to you know take into account this trade off and accordingly see which combination uh, gives both oci and eqi as the lesser values yeah, and in order to improve further uh, to represent the settler we have considered you know a more complex model for the settler which is called as a burger deal settler model by taking you know by taking the drawbacks associated with the takas model uh, in the sense that the number of layers which are considered in takas model are not adequate all the time because the flow is highly dynamic some in rain and storm seasons and of course proper discretization is required to have more accuracy okay the compression and dispersion settling phenomena may be helpful in order to exactly represent the settler dynamics so having these ideas into account a new model for the settler is developed okay and this settler model is integrated with the architecture whatever i have shown earlier with the model and the supervisory controller is implemented here and definitely there is an improvement when compared to a takas model with the bd model so for example in uh, tracking the dissolved oxygen and nitrogen concentrations the uh, blue one is much better than the uh, red one here which is the takas model so definitely there is incentive when we could develop a more bet accurate model to represent the settler dynamics and this is the uh, incentive uh, particularly in terms of you know the operational cost index 
the burger deal uh, settler model provided uh, less value for the sludge production cost compared to a takas model which contributed ultimately for having you know a less value for the oci yeah and this concept uh, has been extended when the interest is to remove both the nutrients both nitrogen and phosphorus here we have you know anaerobic reactors a head of anoxic reactors a seven reactor combination followed by the clarifier and again a supervisory controller is developed based on the ammonia measurements available and then set points are determined and passed to the lower level but here the important point is the disturbances the, the quality are the the problems due to the disturbances are more because there is now availability of phosphorus in the influent itself and also the number of state variables are also more here uh, when we take into account phosphorus also to rem the removal of phosphorus into account and these are the uh, physical uh, configurations or system variables for different uh, variables we have considered as per the benchmark standards and these are the state variables which also includes now you know the phosphorus compounds xpp polyphosphates and polyhydroxyl alkanes and so on and due to that the, the the problem associated with the controllers while rejecting the effect of disturbances will be higher and this is how the influent uh, data when uh, dry for dry conditions and again this is a dynamic data for all the flow this is flow rate and this is for the remaining state variables and we have solved that even for those conditions and then what we have understood was still there are violations in the effluent and to reduce those violations we have integrated a new control scheme of override control between the supervisory control and the lower level control loop so the idea here is the nitrate levels or the total nitrate concentrations in the effluent is usually should be below 18 mg per liter but that depends on the availability of phosphates in the last reactor so we know what is the legal limit for total phosphorus and based on that this supervisory controller determines the nitrate requirements so if the nitrate requirement is greater than or less than 16 mg per liter okay it should be less than so 16 mg per liter accordingly we can call upon the corresponding requirement for the nitrate levels in the anoxic zone so the lower level control loop tracks that nitrate level in the anoxic zone based on what we have for po4 and what is the actual value of no3 available in those aerobic reactors so with that we could you know minimize the violations in the effluent compared to what we had seen earlier control with the earlier control schemes and to do that of course there are different uh, types one can study by maintaining different values for the do concentrations because again you know we need not uh, have uh, constant do values all the time so that is why we checked by varying different uh, do values and evaluated the effluent quality and finally what is eqa and at the same time what is the operational cost and uh, moving further uh, the supervisory control strategies are uh, extended to have you know more number of uh, hierarchical control loops because of the involvement of different uh, controlled variables in the last aerobic reactors so we have uh, developed a nested control loop strategy in order to further improve Uh, the effluent quality and also try to maintain the same operational cost so here the idea is based on the ammonia the set point is determined and passed to the lower levels okay all the lower levels and then finally looking at the effluent quality yeah so these are you know for different cases we have tested for different kinds of uh, data taken from different treatment plants practical treatment plants and we could observe what are the percentage of violations and energies and so on and one more development is by considering uh, different types of uh, sensor mechanisms usually you know uh, this wastewater environment is not friendly environment for sensors 
they tend to spoil many times after uh, prolonged uses so that is why we should look at you know a different kind of mechanism to exactly represent the sensor dynamics so here we have uh, understood a little bit about oxygen sensor and nitrate sensor with different models and then also considering the noise associated with those sensors we could again repeat the control strategies and then uh, analyze it the uh, applicability of those strategies and the results are uh, good even when we are using non ideal sensors usually people what the literature says is people make use of ideal sensors but here we have uh, developed the non ideal sensors and analyze it their uh, uses in the wastewater environment and extended them you know again at the plant level for uh, deployment by integrating with all the remaining units but when we do that we have to take into account the associated models available in for the influent activated sludge anaerobic digester primary clarifier dewatering unit thickener and secondary clarifier and reject water storage so different models are available and all of them are integrated for deployment of for uh, these control strategies at uh, lower as well as higher levels and the results are uh, very good in fact now the legal limits for every variable is uh, under the uh, legal limits so every control strategy follows that and of all these control strategies uh, we could see which control strategy is better by looking at the corresponding oci and the eqi values so whichever gives the lower uh, which com whichever combination provides the lower values of oci and eqi is taken as the best and it is given to the operator for uh, possible consideration so to summarize we have developed different types of uh, control hierarchical control strategies and we have implemented them by developing suitable system identification procedures and of course the observation is there is a trade off between the operational cost and effluent quality and definitely pareto optimal conditions are uh, uh, arrived at and uh, systems engineering tools will definitely solve to an extent the trade off problem between uh, oci and eqi and uh, this uh, can be addressed uh, by you know by developing uh, different types of uh, soft sensors for uh, better prediction of the uh, primary process variables and fault detection and you know uh, whenever a real sensor fails whether the soft sensor can take over and still uh, ensure that the proper control strategy deployed uh, uh, works for some period of time so you know uh, in this uh, domain uh, we, we we have developed a few methods based on the machine learning based approaches and uh, currently we have submitted uh, those works to some uh, publications and this helps in, to some extent uh, to further you know uh, address the problem of uh, minimizing the energy usage and the better effluent quality and at the same time one should have you know uh, reduced models instead of having complex models and uh, this this can also be you know uh, taken up as a promising research area area Uh, the idea is if you can if you can come up with uh, surrogate models it would be in a better alternative and finally you know the whole idea is to get the water energy food health nexus and i think uh, the whole workshop is uh, looking at uh, solving or addressing uh, this nexus yeah so the finally uh, we should have proper decision support in the water sector Yeah. So thank you very much, and uh, yeah. So I'll be happy if you have questions in the panel discussion section. Thank you very thank much, you. Uh, Sishakri. Um, yeah, a very very uh, deep presentation as well in the control systems. Uh, I'm sure that there will be pertinent questions to this as well. Um, I'm, I, I like the fact that the presentations have been very very diverse, uh, but within. the scope of water energy nexus but thanks again sashakri for that